Um, let's start with the title, because stripping bear the body sounds more like a Jeanette Henderson novel to me than a, <laughs> sort of a, a foreign affairs analysis of war and violence. But it refers to the, the body hold, I guess. What, tell us about the title. Uh, well, the title um, comes from a quotation uh, from a friend of mine and a source of mine uh, named Leslie Maniga. Uh, he was uh, a president of Haiti. Uh, I don't expect anyone in this room has heard of him because he was president of Haiti for about three months uh, before he was over overthrown in a military coup in, in 1987. Uh, but uh, President Maniga, also Professor Maniga, who'd been in exile for a long time and studied Haiti and so on, uh, remarked to me at one point that um, political violence is like stripping bare the body. The better to, to place the stethoscope and hear the true life beneath the skin. Uh, the notion that um, if you want to understand a society, understand what makes it tick, understand the stresses within it, uh, the groups that are in power, the groups that are fighting to achieve power, uh, the things going on beneath the surface, then look at a society during times of stress, during a coup d'etat, during a revolution, uh, during a civil war, uh, during or after a terrorist attack, for example, the United States, which uh, I think has revealed a lot in the period since, uh, since the attacks of 9-11. So the book is really about um, these moments of nudity, uh, as Maniga called them, uh, whether it's in Haiti itself, uh, or in the Balkans during the Balkan Wars of the 90s, during the Iraq War, uh, or in the United States uh, and around the world during the so-called uh, worldwide war on terror, uh, when torture became uh, a critical issue. And uh, uh, that's what we found when we stripped that particular body there. This is a conflict that we watched. We watched it on our television screens. And for 50 odd years, there's been this metaphor that's hung over, the, certainly the European or the so-called Western imagination, uh, which is the metaphor of never again. And built into that metaphor is the notion that if uh, people had been able to see the Holocaust as it was going on, it would have been stopped in some way. Uh, and one of the great revelations, I think, of the Balkan Wars was that uh, the West, as an imaginary concept, was quite willing to sit and watch uh, their television screens as a genocide played out in front of them. And in fact, you know, there is a scene in the book where uh, television cameras are brought into Omarska. You know, you see what is in fact a concentration camp filmed in real time and broadcast. I remember vividly when that footage from Omarska was broadcast in the United States, uh, the political the campaign. The the That's right. I'm sure uh, people here remember it vividly of the uh, emaciated people behind barbed wire, emaciated men. Uh, and this was northern Bosnia. And these people were being killed at a very rapid rate, rate not only starved to death, but, uh, but killed. Uh, you know, 50, 40 a night were being uh, brutally, brutally murdered. And I remember vividly when that footage was uh, uh, aired in the United States. Uh, it was during the presidential campaign of George H.W. Bush and Governor, then Governor Bill Clinton. Uh, and uh, George H.W. Bush took the occasion to say defensively, I'm not going to get us into a war because of some television images. You know, I'm going to do what's right for the United States. And Governor Clinton took the occasion to say, we have to stop this. We can't permit this to go on. We have to bomb them if that's what it takes. Uh, and he was able very clever, cleverly to get to the right of George H.W. Bush, the foreign policy president. And of course, when he finally won the election, he did no such thing. So this became useful as an image, it became useful as a political lever, uh, but after he got into office, he not only didn't do anything for several years, he denied that a genocide was, was taking place because the genocide convention seemed to imply that once one admitted it was genocide, one would have to do something. So the, the, the sum result of the Convention Against Genocide was to make the major power lie about whether a genocide was going on uh, or not. We, we tend to have an empirical attitude toward politics, and it drives us crazy when you have a political party that says things that, is, that are demonstrably untrue. You know, the Democrats have run up this huge debt when it's the Republicans. And Democrats, you know, traditionally have sort of railed about that and said, you know, get the facts right. But I think most people, when it comes to politics, facts are somewhat irrelevant. It's about beliefs. 
they believe certain things about Democrats, that they're weak sisters and uh, they're weak on terror and they're weak on crime, that they're big spending and so on. And all you have to do is touch particular keys, keywords, to revivify that belief. It isn't dependent on reality, alas. Uh, and I've seen this again and again. I covered the, uh, the 2004 election, uh, presidential election in, in the United States. And I would go to these Bush rallies uh, and interview people before Bush took the stage. Uh, you know, very educated people who read the paper every day and were very interested in current events. Uh, Republicans, obviously. And I was shocked by the number of people I found who were absolutely convinced that the weapons of mass destruction had been found in Iraq. And these are people who read the paper, they were very well informed, and yet they were convinced of this. And I finally concluded that um, you know, they, were, they believed in Bush so strongly that they were unable to believe that what he said was wrong. So they simply reordered reality to conform to their belief and their faith in Bush. I mean, Colin Powell is, I think, one of the most fascinating uh, figures in this, in this book. Because as you say, he plays at least a double role, and, and, and he goes, he's a figure throughout the book um, who really single-handedly prevented uh, any real intervention in the Balkans for several years. Uh, you know, he said, whenever I hear politicians talking about surgical strikes, I head for my bunker. You know, he was a veteran of, of Vietnam, uh, had a very interesting service, actually, in Vietnam, um, uh, connected to some degree to the My Lai massacre, and, and, you know, he's a fascinating figure, but one thing he learned and said in his memoirs, I will never be one of those who stand by while the politicians commit us to a war that they're not willing to conclude. And he uh, basically performed a kind of blocking action when it came to the Balkans and prevented any sort of halfway intervention as he described it. You know, this book is about the late Cold War followed through uh, the post-Cold War era, which is uh, you know, a strange category, post-Cold War, it's like non-fiction, you know, it defines something by what it's not, uh, into the present war on terror, if we want to call that. Looking back at the post-Cold War era now, we could call it the age, of, uh, the age of genocide. And I think it's a fact that U.S. stewardship, which is how America's foreign policy mandarins like to think of the, the country's role, have traditionally thought of it, the U.S. stewardship during that era uh, has... Uh, been pretty faulty. Um, there were two very large genocides, one of them in Europe, one in Africa in the 90s. Uh, there was this attack, obviously, on the United States, completely unanticipated. And then there was a, a, a war of choice, an invasion and occupation of Iraq, uh, which I think, uh, on balance, uh, immensely damaged the country and also hurt it in the so-called war on terror. So I think it is true I'm very critical, but I think I'm very critical for a reason, which is that the United States uh, foreign policy during this era has been erratic, uh, it's been experimental, it's been tentative, it's been brazen, it's been blundering, uh, it's been under George W. Bush, it's been evangelical in a way that I think called, caused the rest of the world uh, a serious nightmare, uh, the nightmare of uh, American power unbound by anything but its own extent, by its own power, not by law or anything else. I say brazen, blundering, and unbound is a pretty good <laughs> synopsis of perhaps the Bush era, the George W. Bush Do you think era. that's highly critical? Or, <laughs> <you know? laughs> I want to put words into your mouth. Um, you, you talk about George W. Bush being evangelical about Iraq, and yet... Britain, Australia, many others were prepared to go with them, or some others were prepared to go with them. Why, why were countries like Australia and Britain prepared to go with them? Simply because we couldn't afford to take the risk of not being there, or because George W. Bush was so persuasive, his evangelical powers were so persuasive? Well, I think you know everything becomes different if your thought experiment takes you back to two months before the Iraq War and you believe George W. Bush that this is going to be a three-month engagement. The Iraqi regime is going to crumble instantly. Uh, the Iraqis in general are going to welcome the Americans as liberators. Uh, and by the end of the summer, which is to say after four months, uh, all but about 20,000 American troops are going to be gone. And that really was, ridiculous as it sounds, that was the assumption 
uh, of the top levels of the American administration. I but think there was plenty of people under them, and publicly and privately, presumably, telling them that was not how it was going to be. Well, I, I guess I would say I'm not sure how many. There were a lot of people under them who knew it wasn't going to be that way. Whether or not they were being listened to uh, is highly questionable. You know, the administration, we get here into styles of leadership. And uh, the George W. Bush administration was unique, I think, in American history in how closed the decision-making loop was. That people, there were plenty of people in the American government who knew everything about Iraq. I mean, who knew a lot about Iraq and knew about Sunnis and Shia and knew about Saddam and knew about the regime and knew about how decrepit the regime was and the infrastructure and all the rest of it. All this was known beforehand. I mean, I knew it. You know, a lot of people knew it. Um, but the, the leadership cadre, if you can call it that, was not listening to those people. Uh, George, I know an Iraqi who met with George W. Bush a couple of weeks before the invasion, this guy I interviewed in, in Baghdad, fascinating man, who was astonished to discover that George W. Bush had no idea about the difference between Sunni and Shia. And, you know, now, did people around him know? Yes, they did. But were they willing to uh, raise this as a possible concern about uh, post-war strife? Uh, all evidence suggests that you know, people basically started to believe, as Colin Powell eventually did, you know what, this is going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it. Strap ourselves in and hope for the best. And they had no plan B um, for all of its faults. It was an ideological response to 9-11. I mean, the notion was, how can we respond to these young men who you know, look at the United States and see it as the great overwhelming imperial power supporting the Mubarak regime in Egypt, supporting the House of Saud, all these regimes that are oppressing them, that they view as apostate regimes. Uh, how can we dissuade them for want, from wanting to attack the United States to lift up these auto autocracies? And their answer was, we dissuade them by breaking up this whole logjam of decrepit politics in the Middle East. And we do it not by doing anything about the Egyptians, to whom, of course, we, we give $2 billion in foreign aid every year, and uh, with whom you would think we would have a little bit of influence. No, no, we can't touch them. We can't do anything about the Iranians, because that's this very large state that um, we will not be easy to take down. How about Iraq? That's the most likely demonstration case here. We can go in quickly, it'll be easy, get out. Um, I think these allies of the United States were faced with a choice. They knew that the Americans were going to go in. They knew this from the spring of 2002. And the question is, did they want to be on the winning team or not? And, um, and I think the Americans placed that question fairly squarely before them. And Tony Blair, uh, you know, we know this, essentially said, I want to be on the winning side. As if you're looking at this in terms of the broader war on terror, as it was conceived by the Bush administration, this essentially, the invasion and occupation of an Arab country was essentially stepping into the very caricature that Osama bin Laden had made of the United States. Just the way those images from Abu Ghraib, you know, notably that image of, of Lindy England, you know, the, the female uh, American soldier standing there in fatigues holding a leash, a leash going down to the neck of a naked Iraqi man whose face is scrunched in, in agony and humiliation. That was a perfect poster uh, for Osama's entire message, which is that the United States humiliates, emasculates, uh, destroys uh, Arabs. And, you know, those images uh, basically simply reaffirmed them. And, of course, the images were real. This was not a poster they put together. They were real. And you if say it like this in the book. You say, America became the America the jihadists depicted, an imper imperial, aggressive, blundering power that managed by means of lurid, deathless images of tortured Muslims to prove to the world that all of its purported respect for human rights and freedom was nothing but base hypocrisy. I guess that's kind of critical as well, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, it's an interesting fact about uh, uh, Barack Obama, I think, that he has a very different understanding of the political reality of the war on terror or the war on violent, the global struggle against violent extremism, which the military wanted to change the war on terror to at some point. They wanted to call it G-SAVE, global struggle against violent extremism. Uh, and they got the entire government on board. This was around 2005, except the president, God bless him, kept saying war on terror, war on terror, war on terror. He just liked it too much. So 
Uh, but Obama has a very different understanding of the war as a political war. Because after all, when you think of this, and I put war sort of in quotation marks here, but when you think about it, the war on terror is not going to end with the United States killing every jihadist. Uh, presumably it will end, uh, or it will at least slack off, at a certain moment when you don't have rising number of people who one way or another want to support the jihadist cause. I mean, you can think of it, when you think of the strategy of the war, think of it as a, a target, uh, you know, an archery target, where you know, at the very red, or the, is it the yellow center or red center? The red center, you have jihadist active people who are blowing things up, who are uh, setting bombs, training, etc. And then you have a circle around them in which you have people who are actively helping them, another circle around them in which you have people who are giving them money, another circle in which you have people who are politically sympathetic to them, and another in which people are, you know, look at them, don't turn them in, but don't necessarily support them. And, and seen in this way, the strategy behind the, the global war on terror, or the global struggle against violent extremism, is to stop those people from moving to the center. Now, if you look at what the jihadists, uh, what their problem with the United States, the heart of it is that the U.S. is the puppet master behind these repressive apostate regimes. That is, these regime, regimes claim to be Islamic, they're not. Uh, they're simply the cat's paw of the United States. Now, Obama stands in the Capitol, you know, in Cairo. He talks about the U.S. as a beacon of human rights, but at the same time, he's under the shadow of a regime that the U.S. supports, and that if it could get its hands on those jihadists, would torture them severely, as it has, by the way, Ayman al-Zawahiri, you know, the number two man to Osama bin Laden. So, you know, there's one, it's one thing to uh, admit this kind of rhetoric, which is brilliant, by the way, and is very important. It's, I think it's very important. It's not negligible. But it's another thing to try to change the policy, because the policy has to do with problems that have been part of U.S. It, US global role as a superpower for years. You know, the su supporting of dictatorships uh, throughout Latin America, for example, uh, as an alternative to perhaps communist penetration. You know, we have the same thing now on a different scale in the Middle East, the U.S. supporting autocracies in part as a bulwark against Islamic revolution. Um, so that political problem still is there, and how do you solve it if you're Barack Obama? We're talking about a much more radical change in what the U.S., how the U.S. operates in the world, and no one, no one, is talking about that. The fact is, uh, there's going to have to be a way to get out of um, the whole conundrum of torture. And um, a case has been brought in Spanish court, for example, under Euros universal jurisdiction against the lawyers. Uh, that case will proceed one way or another. Um, there is a case in federal court brought by Jose Padilla against John Yu. I mean, there are various cases going down the various slow frozen rivers of, of uh, the court system, both internationally and domestically, and these cases have a way of eventually reaching <laughs> some sort of conclusion. Um, I think Obama feels he's in an untenable position when it has to do with decisions that the Bush administration made. Uh, if he uh, starts to prosecute people in the CIA who imposed these policies, uh, he will lose the intelligence community. They will rebel against him, which is perilous for a politician. Um, it will be perceived by a lot of people as unfair because these people were indeed following orders. You know, the Nuremberg echo is real, but, it, but it's true. It's very interesting how torture happened. The CIA in the mid-70s, there's a notorious investigation in the United States called the Church Commission, which unveiled all the dirty laundry of the CIA, including a number of assassinations. And that lives as a nightmare in the history of the CIA. And when the administration made it clear to the intelligence community, we want you to torture these guys, basically. Uh, the CIA had a simple answer, which is, if you do, show me the document that says it's legal. They called it the Golden Shield. So until the D Department of Justice wrote out these memos, which you can now read, you know, I published them in my book six years ago, um, until they did that and redefined waterboarding as not torture, the CIA w was not and would not do it. Uh, so now you have an entire government that essentially is corrupted by these decisions. You know, everybody at the top knew about it. They talked about it. So, you know, do you put George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, John Ashcroft, you can go down the whole list and march them all up in front of the judge? <laughs> 
as I put it that way, I'm thinking, well, is that a rhetorical question? Um, uh, you know, so you have the entire government implicated, and that mass implication is what, to some degree, protects them. Um, and it wouldn't be fair to simply prosecute the people who did the waterboarding, because they were, indeed, looking at legal documents and doing it. I mean, we can argue about that. Obviously, the Nuremberg defense has its own uh, problems. Um, but we're in a similar situation. It's as if, you know, the Germans had not been defeated, and all those things they did under the Nuremberg laws were legal. Well, in the United States, all those things that happened in those rooms, in secret rooms in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Poland, uh, the black sites that I've, I've written about, um, all those things are now considered officially legal. It's incredible. And what's incredible, too, is that our time is up. <laughs> right, Jonah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.